as you all know, I'm still chasing PBs, personal bests for those that um, use another another set of initials. I don't think about it much, but I know that no one can chase PBs forever. There's a point where you start to plateau and then eventually you get slower. Of course, I like running for so many other reasons. The feeling of freedom when you're out for a long run, the camaraderie of running with others, the satisfaction of being able to get somewhere using just my running shoes and my two feet. But part of me still wonders if running will be as satisfying once I stop getting faster. Well, luckily, why we run and how this can change throughout our life is one of the questions today's book tries to answer. Along with other questions like, can our self-talk help us succeed in the marathon if things don't flow the way we expected on race day? Hi, and welcome to the Running Book Reviews podcast, where we review books written for runners, about runners, and by runners to help you decide if you would like to read the book for yourself. We also hope that listening to us chat about running can help keep you motivated about your own running or maybe inspire you to try something new. My name is Liz, and with my co-host Alan, we are going to talk with authors Noel Brick and Stuart Holiday about their book, The Psychology of Running. The Psychology of Running is part of the series, book series, called The Psychology of Everything. It sounds increasingly like Hitch's, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, The Psychology of Life, the Universe, and Everything. So there's a whole series of books, in fact, which includes The Psychology of Art, The Psychology of Wellness, The Psychology of Comedy, The Psychology of Democracy, The Psychology of Counseling, The Psychology of Travel, the psychology of attachment. Um, but we're here today to talk about the psychology of running. You're probably, at that point, you're probably feeling disappointed, all those intriguing <laughs> subjects. Um, this book dives into the science of running to answer six questions that make up the six chapters of the book. Why do we run? Why do we slow down or stop? What will help me run faster? What should I be focusing my attention on? Can running help me feel better? And are running-based programs beneficial for children and adults? So that's sort of the chapter headings of the book. And we're going to hear more about that as we go in from the experts. Um, let me tell you a bit about these, these two British guys we have in front of us. Um, first of all, Noel Brick. He is a lecturer in sport and exercise psychology at Ulster University in Ireland. Actually, don't know if you're if you're actually Irish, Noel. So I may have insulted you by calling you you British. I don't know. I'm um, I'm Irish, but but it's okay. <laughs> yeah, my apologies. <laughs> He's a chartered psychologist with the British Psychological Society and a registered sport and exercise psychologist with the Health and Care Professions Council, HCPC. He has applied his experience as a sports and exercise psychologist in a range of performance settings, including running, cycling, powerlifting, and the Gaelic Games. Noel's research interests include psychology of endurance performance, with an emphasis on the psychology of long-distance running. This is what we want to hear about. His research also focuses on mental health in sport. As a runner, Noel has competed over, completed over 30 marathons and ultramarathons, including the Marathon des Sables, in 2012 and the Boston Marathon in 2022. Noel is also co-author co -author of another book, The Genius of Athletes. On to Stuart. Stu Holiday is a chartered psychologist with the British Psychological Society and a registered sport and exercise psychologist with the Health and Care Professionals Council. This is obviously what your connection is. Maybe we'll hear about that. He has worked for over 10 years in the field with Olympic, Paralympic, and Premiership squads and teams. I assume I'm reading Premiership. There. I'm talking about. Are you talking about Premiership soccer? Yeah, yeah. Wow, cool. wow, very cool. Um, I'm a big fan. Alan's of Sunderland. a massive fan. Sunderland are my team. Not quite Premiership. His main interest is in endurance sports and running in particular. He works in private practice with athletes at all compet competitive levels, and is a keen club runner competing across all distances up to the marathon. Stuart was a contributing author to Touring and Mental Health, the Music Industry Manual. So welcome, Stu, and welcome, Noel. Hi there. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Liz. 
So I guess the first question is, um, how did you decide to write the book? But also because there's two of you, how did you decide to write it together? Yeah, maybe, well, I'll maybe start on that one. Um, so I, I guess the, the idea for this book um, probably started about maybe, um, well, well, in one way, maybe started about seven or eight years ago um, when I was completing my PhD. Um, and I kind of looked a lot at the um, the psychology of endurance performance generally and, and specifically looking at attention, what we focus on when we run and how that impacts on performance, how we feel, et cetera. But I guess on the, on the back of that, you know, I always kind of had an idea of, of writing a book and maybe it was kind of finding the right place for that book to sit. Um, so Alan mentioned the, the psychology of everything series and, and I came across you know, a number of books in that series, maybe about maybe four, three, four years ago. And and as I searched through the psychology of everything, I realized there isn't a book here called The Psychology of Running. So it's not quite the psychology of everything. Um, so so I, I, this was about, I guess, maybe three years ago now, I submitted um, a proposal for that book to the editor. Thankfully, that was accepted. And then I probably spent about six to eight months and not doing anything, procrastinating, wondering, OK, how am I going to get started on this thing? Um, and I kind of realized, you know, it wasn't going to get done unless, you know, I kind of reached out to somebody who I knew would be able to to help write the book, who I knew as a practitioner in the area would be able to to help make the book better. Um, and, and that's when I reached out to Stu and had a chat about this this sort of idea for a book and, and what might be in it, what it might look like. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, well, it really started from there because by that point, very little had been written on the book. Yeah, so... As, as Noel said, he was the originator for the for the book's conception. And one thing he didn't mention was that in the process of it being commissioned by Routledge, I was one of the practitioners who had to review the initial synopsis and they send it round to me and other people in the field to say, does it pass the sniff test, basically? And I had just finished my chartership, which is the professional qualification that um, allows you to practice legally, ethically. And I was in lockdown. And because Noel had worked on the project called Resist, which might come up in this conversation, which was a bunch of sports psychologists from predominantly academia who were trying to understand at what the science of why we slow down or stop in endurance running. I had come in right at the end of that project as part of my research and doing a study with Professor Andy Lane, who you may have heard of in the research literature. And Andy put me forward to review the book. And I quite happily in lockdown with time on my hands said, sure. And I read this synopsis and I was thinking, oh, that's a shame. That's the book I wanted to write. <laughs> that, that sounds brilliant. It, it well, it really did pass the sniff test. And then, subsequently, we were in touch more and more. <clears throat> I was working more in the field, so I work with people who come to me who are needing psychological support, help, and improving their performance. Noel does the same, but predominantly his work is in the research field at Ulster Uni. <clears throat> and maybe because of that, he said at one point, "Hey, I really want to get this book." Cross the line, but I need support. Can you help me close it out? And, you know, do you want to think about it? And I think more or less on the day I told him the story that I'd read this, I'd been one of the, I don't know whether they're anonymous or not, but I'd been one of the people saying, yeah, go ahead. This this book's been well researched, structured. You know, it's it's got a skeleton, but it needs flesh put on the bones. But when he said, would you like to be involved? I was like saying, well, I wish I'd written the book. So it's going to be an easy win for you to get me on board. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so, you know, before we get started on, uh, you know, specific topics, uh, there, you know, there are six chapters. Are there any chapters that you wish you would have included that you didn't, or were you able to kind of put all the information that you thought, uh, you wanted to be in there into those six, six chapters that you ended up dividing the book into? Yeah, certainly for me, I think, um, you know, I guess to kind of, mentioned even putting the book proposal together there was a lot of a lot of planning even at that point you know a lot of ideas of what could go in here you know i guess one of my 
uh, originally one of my main aims for for the book was that we were we were putting a book out there that was evidence based. You know, that was based on good quality research. For example, you know what helps mm -hmm. runners perform better, or you know we we have a chapter in there which is probably. Um, before I wrote the book, the chapter I was most excited about researching, not just writing, but researching, which was around um, how running can benefit our, our, our mood, our mental health, our well-being, et cetera. Um, so, you know, through that process, I guess, you know, we sort of condensed it down to six chapters, which I'm not going to say it was absolutely everything we could write about in terms of psychology of running, but but I think, you know, I know we'll talk a little bit about motivation. The the stuff that I was most intrinsically motivated and excited about researching and, and writing about, certainly for me originally, those those were the things that went in there. So yeah, no, I from my perspective, I would feel we we've we've certainly got a lot of things in there that I would like to read if I was a runner. I'll put it that way, and I am a runner, so I do mm -hmm. like to read it. <laughs> yeah, if you write an appendix, so I guess you could do. Um, what should Alan and Liz be doing in order to get their marathon time slightly quicker? That would be the uh, the appendix I would recommend to you. Mm -hmm. um, early early on in the uh, book, you sort of set the scene a little bit, talking about e evolution and um, you know how man developed, and it's pretty interesting when you look at man and he's he's not the fastest, and he doesn't have the sharpest claws, and he doesn't have the pointiest teeth, and uh, um, so. People say, well, yeah, he's got a good brain, so he can think his way around the problems. It's difficult to think your way around a problem when you've got a saber-toothed tiger standing on your chest. So um, maybe you could give us a bit of insight in how it it would seem that running sh has shaped our evolution. Yeah, I think so. So I guess we started at that point, you know, it was broadly a chapter, why do we run? And, and I guess... But from one perspective, that seemed a nice place to start. Um, and I think what's what's really interesting about some of the the research in that area is, and look at various, you know, if we, if we talk about the physical structure of of the body, and if we look at various structures like, you know, from from literally our toes upwards, um, how, for example, so many structures in our feet, our Achilles tendon, etc help us to run better um don't necessarily contribute a whole lot to, to walking more efficiently but certainly contribute to, to running more efficiently and, and it was some of and i mentioned those specifically because it was some of those um physical um attributes or whatever we might call them uh, that da daniel lieberman and colleagues originally sort of speculated um about how humans may be evolved because of running and and rather than maybe simply walking um so so i think one side when we look Physically, a lot of those characteristics is really interesting. Probably the one area that, that I found most fascinating, again, from a, uh, an evolutionary perspective, was how um, running shaped our brain and running helped um, the evolution of, of the human brain and, and a model that we write about called the adaptive capacity model. Um, basically, if you want to sort of summarize that model, it's use it or lose it uh, a type model. Um, but, but it gives a really nice perspective on how running and the things that we do cognitively, mentally, when we run, like plan, think, survey the scenery. If we if we run cross country or if we run on a trail, we're we're looking at the route ahead of us. We're planning our you know planning our directions, but also even planning our footfall and, and where we place our foot. And and all those mental activities stimulate our brain to adapt. Uh, and from an evolutionary perspective, stimulated our brain to evolve. Um, so so I think it's really fascinating and, and intriguing to think about how running shaped both physically but also cognitively how we evolved as humans so so yeah it seemed like a, a logical place to start the book um to, to answer one one part of an answer to the question of why do we run that's pretty fascinating because i've never really thought about it uh, in 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 that that way around um i guess i've always thought oh we're humans we have like decent brains with all sorts of uh, capabilities and then we have some running and we apply that within our capabilities not we're humans and we run and because we run our brains develop in certain ways and give us certain advantages so that's that's i've just i'm just having an aha moment here already <laughs> although although i guess um also uh, on the other side i guess it makes it it explains a little bit why, you know, we can think so much during a race. Um, and it also means, you know, 
like we think a lot, but it doesn't mean that the thoughts are necessarily productive. I guess, I guess when we started running, it would have been more about survival. But when we run for recreation, you know, we think about all kinds of things sometimes like the little pain that we have in our foot. And then we panic because we're like, oh, I don't think I'm going to be able to hold this pace because I have a pain in my foot. Um, and that just kind of makes us, you know, spiral into, you know, bad place. So um, one of the things that you talk about in the book is uh, is how is what to focus on when you're running. I know this is a big topic, but how do you I guess let's start with how do you know if you're not focusing on the right thing? Is there any way that you would help athletes identify if they weren't focusing on the right thing? I do think, I mean, Noel's going to give his academic and practice brain uh, answer, I'm sure, following me. But when I'm working with athletes, that's one of the first things that I really go to in my questioning is like, what do you think about when you're running? And try and get a feel for that and then compare it against what the optimal advice that we put in the book is and like you were saying liz in a in a road race a linear fat fast flat one maybe runners will you know they, they have less sensory information to take in potentially than maybe if they were orienteering mm -hmm. so it's it is it's a it's a good starting point to ask yourself um what do I think about when I think about running, which is also another famous book out there. Yeah, it is another famous. We didn't read that one yet, but I think we both have it in our bookshelf. So we need to get on that, Alan. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just, before, just before Noel chips in, I guess uh, um, there, are, there are two aspects for me. If I'm racing, I'll be checking in on how my machine is performing. So if, I, if I'm running hard, I'm checking the machine, so to speak, or the running machine. Um if I'm training and I'm jogging, checking the scenery and trying to write my grocery list and <laughs> humming the song I heard. Um, so, you know, there's sort of like two really big, like buckets of thought, I think. Yeah, I, I would agree. And and I, you know, to my my question in response to, to a question is, you know, how do I know if I'm focusing on the right thing? Um, I suppose that the question I would ask is, okay, what's the right thing for you? What, what's your what's your goal for that run? What's your motivation for for that run? Um, is it to enjoy it? In which case, focusing on a certain bucket might be useful, um, or is it to run faster and, and to optimize your performance and to pace it appropriately and all, all those kind of things? Um, as you know, as any runner will know, and as you mentioned, Liz, you know, our thoughts go everywhere sometimes, and and you know, one minute I can be thinking about. Um, you know, pushing myself as hard as possible up an incline and encouraging myself to get up there and, you know, being my my own best cheerleader to try to get up that hill as fast as possible. Uh, and then 30 seconds later, I could be sort of questioning myself, did I leave that pan on, <laughs> you know, <laughs> did I leave the cooker on at home? Yeah. And, oh, yeah. wow. And actually that does help me run faster. But um, but yeah, so, so, so I think that, you know, that is part of it is, is what is the goal, um, for, for the run? And, you know, this was kind of, I suppose, one of the key questions, this was really my PhD, I guess, all those years ago was, um, you know, broadly looking at the area of attention and our thoughts and how that impacts on performance, enjoyment, et cetera. And the two buckets, I guess, that you mentioned, Alan, one is broadly has been in the research called being dissociation or distract, you know, thoughts like, you know, even focusing on the scenery, those th thoughts about the conversation I had yesterday or what I'm mm -hmm. going to do when I get home or singing to myself or, or whatever. Um, and then association or those kind of thoughts, which are, you know, how's my body feeling? Can I push the pace a little bit more? Maybe focusing on my stride or or whatever it might be to help, to help my pace. So yeah, th there's lots of things, but what the research does show is that some help performance and some help us run faster, like those second group of thoughts I spoke about. And some actually help to make it feel easier, maybe slow down our pace a little bit when we're distracted, but but helps it feel easier and more pleasant. And that can be a good thing if if that's your goal. Okay, I guess if you're training and you're just looking to get through a lot of miles, like I'm in base building at the moment, so I'm just looking to to get lots of miles into my legs. Um, doing the dissociation and the distractive thinking is actually probably quite good, in fact. 
because you get to do the miles without it feeling hard. So you're mentally fresh the next day to do another um, reasonably long session. So, so I'm focused on, you know, performance, obviously not right now it's winter here and like, you can't run anything fast because it's too, um, it's too snowy and everything. But I find that the runs that I've done the best, I felt like I thought about nothing, which um, I guess is like, you know, what they call flow. I think that's sort of if you if you're talking to me about flow, that's how I think it should feel. It's that feeling that you're just running and you feel like you're basically floating through the air and and you're thinking about nothing like your brain is empty. Um, You're not thinking about anything good. You're not thinking about anything bad. You're just not thinking I guess. <laughs> so, um, so I don't know, like, it, am I, am I correct or do I have it wrong? Or like, because I think you can, because I guess what I, I sometimes strive to not think about anything when I, when I'm trying to run fast. Um, and then I know that you can give yourself cues like Alan was talking about, like, oh, am I, are my shoulders relaxed? Uh, but then I know those cues, if you take them too far, they can, they can be a negative thing and they can actually take away from your running because you're overthinking things that are supposed to be automatic. How do we start figuring out what our sweet spot is? Because obviously we're not all the same, unfortunately, because I would just take Alan's advice. <laughs> I think if I, if, I, if I could chip in first, um, we, did, we did some research. We talk about it in the book um, about that, that idea of flow um and um i think you know it, it's very often a rare thing but as you've described Liz, it's just it feels effortless we're completely immersed in the run and, and sometimes just thoughts don't seem to happen we're just right there in in the moment in our run um it's magic and it is yeah mm -hmm. and it's so enjoyable and the time goes so quickly um and then you go out on the same route the next day and it feels yeah, normal. Not the same. I was going to say horrendous, but no, normal. <laughs> no, normal. <laughs> um, but but you know, one thing we were curious about in the study was, okay, can we? Are there things we can do? Are there psychological strategies we can do that make it more likely that we might experience state? Um, and one thing that came out of that, so we interviewed runners who, during a training run, reported what they called an optimal experience, which was you know a state like flow and um, where it just felt effortless. And it was quite a cool study. It was led by a colleague in Lincoln, University of Lincoln called uh, Patricia Jackman. Um, and basically we called for runners to get in touch with us if they experienced something like that during a training run. And we interviewed them and we asked them, what were you thinking about before the run? Did you have any targets in mind when you went for your run? What, what sort of strategies did you use? And a couple of really interesting key things emerged. One was they tended to use non-specific or what's called open goals um, as opposed to a specific target or a specific goal which most of us would, would realize which is you know run a marathon in three hours so that's a very specific goal or run a mm -hmm. 5k in, in 20 minutes that's a very specific goal mm -hmm. um, a non-specific or an open goal is I'm just going to go for a run today and see how see how I do see how fast I run no real target just see how it goes um, and what we sort of found was that people who tended to set those kind of goals tend to be more likely to get into their run. And probably, you know, the reason is I'm not checking my watch. I'm not, as you mentioned, I'm not focused on my stride or my technique as much. I'm just letting it happen. Uh, and so we're more likely to get into a flow-like state um, because of that. Um, people also did other things, which, you know, that's quite an easy thing to do. Just have a go like that before you run. And, you know, what I would say to listeners is, is try that, you know, same way, just see how it goes. Try a goal like that and just see how you feel during a run like that. It doesn't mm -hmm. guarantee a flow state, but it's maybe more likely. Um, and we also found that people had more curiosity type goals or exploratory type goals when they went for a run. So it's like, okay, maybe here's here's a route that I haven't done in a while or that I, I run before. Um, I'm just going to go there and, you know, just go for a run and see how it goes. Um, and it's that novelty aspect, that real intrinsic, this is, this is a cool place to run. I'm seeing new things. And again, we're more likely to get immersed in the run when, when we have those, maybe some of those features. So, so those are a couple of things to try, um, you know, and certainly that first one, um, playing around a bit with the goals that you set for a training run and see how you feel. That's actually really interesting because um, I used to train with a different club um, and the coach of that club, he would sometimes set for us 
what I thought were unrealistic goals. He would go on the Macmillan calculator and he would say, well, you know, you ran your 1500 in this time, so you should be able to run a 3000 in this time. And I would, I would remember sometimes like looking at the times that he was predicting and just thinking like, that's completely impossible. So then what I would do is I would just try not to think about it. And I would be like, okay, well, John, we'll see, because his name was John. <laughs> and uh, I would just go out and that was kind of what I had it was like, well, I'm just going to go and see like what happens. And sometimes I would get really close and other times I would get the time that he had predicted. I think later um, I stopped doing that because I guess um, in a lot of the goal setting that you hear about and, and read about, it's all about setting specific goals. And so, um, you know, and the idea is that you put it out there as, as a goal so that it yeah, also we, keeps you accountable. Outcome, what we call outcome goals. Yeah, but also very yeah. specific, you know, yeah. like, because, yeah, you can have process goals where you're like, well, I'm going to try and run like 10 kilometers a week more than I ran last year during my training cycle. Mm. But, but the, but the thing is like, you know, when you're setting, I mean, in a way that, that same thing that you were talking about where you say, well, I'm just going to go out and see what happens. It's a bit of an outcome goal. It's just that you don't, you're not saying what the outcome is going to be, but yeah. you're still working towards an outcome. Whereas this is more like, well, you're saying, okay, well, I want this outcome goal of this amount. So I guess I kind of shifted, but maybe is the secret to go back to those, um, I guess, non-specific goals. Like, is that, is that better? There is a bit of a, it depends um, what, what the research, and again, it's very recent research with, with open goals. What the research does say is that, okay, one of the answers to it depends is maybe, you know, your motivations as a runner or even your experience as a runner. Um, more experienced runners tend to actually prefer specific goals. Um, you know, I if I was to give a very personal example, you know, I can be quite competitive with myself when I run. I want to, you spoke about personal bests, et cetera. I like to go out and run faster on a route. Mm -hmm. um, so for that reason, I do, you know, there is a lot of enjoyment for a specific goal and we can get a lot of enjoyment for that. And we like chasing our targets, but actually sometimes for, for beginners or for less experienced, so maybe somebody taking up running for the first time, actually open goals can be more enjoyable and feel less pressurized. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the McMillan calculator and, and yeah, like trying to hit those times can be very pressurizing and, mm -hmm. and sometimes that can they're take very aggressive. <laughs> they are incredibly aggressive. Um, yeah. So, you know, there, there is a lot of it depends. And I, I actually, you know, and there's no real research to back up what I'm about to say, but even during a run, I quite like to play around with the goals. Um, so sometimes if I'm running uphill and I'm struggling because I look at my watch and suddenly it's dropped by 30 seconds per mile, I, I sometimes switch to an open goal. So, okay, just just keep going and see see how fast I can run up this hill rather than try to run up it in 7.30 minute per mile pace, which which can be extremely challenging. So even just playing around with your goals in a run can help with, with specific moments like that as well. Okay. But at the end of the day, the marathon in three hours – has to be done in three hours, Liz. So you're going to have to come back to specific goals if you want to no, do darling. that. You can't oh, just okay. you can't just run. Well, I'll see how it goes, and it'll be three hours. Mm. Um, it, I guess. You know. Yeah, I don't know. So, is there any research there's, on there's that? There's going to be a mix. <laughs> now, let me change it up a little bit. Um, something that that I read in the book, which is sort of near and dear to my heart, especially with my um, marathon sub three marathon effort of, at the end of 2022. I think in chapter two, you say the ultimate limit to our performance may well be psychological because the fascinating uh, studies around that were, were I think they, you were able or some researchers were able to identify all the metabolites associated with fatigue. So you get into a, an, an absolute fatigue and you have all these metabolites. But if I take all those metabolites and inject them into you, um, you don't get a, a fatigue feeling. So there's some sort of contributory effect that's coming from your psychology. Um, I, I distill this sort of down to your brain messes with you and switches your legs off before your legs need to be switched off or, or when your legs really have an ability to keep carrying you. And that if you could somehow 
unmess your brain that you could get those extra few minutes that you need just to get over the line. One, is that true? Uh, two, how do we do it? Mm. I need like five minutes, five minutes. Yeah, let's, let's small steps, let's small <laughs> okay. steps. <laughs> okay, let's start with one minute. <laughs> No, maybe if you talk about it from the research point of view, I can talk about it from the uh, practitioner. Yeah, there, there's, um, I guess there's lots of different feelings or perceptions that can influence how, how we're on. So I guess to, just to dig into a few things. Um, so yeah, of course, first of all, there, there are physical limits to endurance performance. Um, most runners would know of terms like VO2 max or even various thresholds and things like that. Yeah. But um, some of the interesting things in in this research area are some of the perceptions or feelings we have. So one, for example, is perception of effort, how hard a run feels or how easy a run feels. Um, and I think most people would be able to relate to that, you know, going faster or going uphill generally feels harder. We know what that feels like. Um, and what a lot of research and models in this area would suggest is that actually that's the ultimate thing that limits how fast we go. So what, what causes you to slow down towards the end of a marathon? Um, there are certain physical things that can happen, you know, in terms of fuel stores, et cetera. But there are also certain psychological things that happen. It feels hard and, and it can be motivationally, it can be very difficult to push myself to go farther when it feels so difficult and feels so hard. And that's one of the reasons why, why it tends to slow down. Um, there's also, you mentioned about met metabolites, um, Alan, this is very specific about a slightly different sensation called exercise induced pain. Um, and some really cool research on that, which as you mentioned, has shown that when we, um, inject a mix of metabolites, so lactate, ATP and protons is the special concoction that actually we get a very similar, like burning type sensation that we get when we're doing say tough 400 meter intervals or, or something like that. That's sort of feeling you get in your quads. For me, at least, anyway, or your hamstrings, so, and that pain again in events like that can cause us to slow down because it just feels so difficult. I guess you know and there's others as well, but those are some some of the really, I suppose, interesting ones for now. But on the cool side, and this is Stu, where I think so, you know, in terms of practice, what helps? You know, okay, we we feel those things, we experience those things, but we want to run, run faster. What helps? And this is where some some of our psychological strategies can become really useful. So some nice evidence. For around things like self-talk, for example, and how it can help us maintain performance or reduce the slowdown when we start to feel those things. Um, so Stu, I get, you know, kind of, you know, you've worked a lot with athletes and in terms of working on those strategies to, to help in those moments. Yeah. And and I've heard you talk on this show about um various strategies. People like Matt Fitzgerald is very big on the on the on this. And exactly what we're saying there working with athletes like yourselves i would be really trying to dig into what is it that you're saying to yourself when it's getting hard and when you when it's suffering do you have a perception that the suffering that you are going through physically you know like you, you might be perceiving it physically it could also be mental and getting you to challenge that but also understand that it could be your brain and how can you differentiate between actual we talk about this in the book between actual injury inducing pain and the the exercise induced pain which you inevitably go through when you're doing endurance running and getting you to understand the relationship that you have like Noel was talking about you've got to it depends on your particular makeup so how alan experiences exercise induced pain in certain sessions training races and then liz and how you experience it might be different so we have to really understand how your mind works and inability to cope. And the other thing that we're, we haven't touched on here is also about the belief effect, about your, your self-efficacy and belief in order to be able to use self-talk to convince yourself uh, through verbal persuasion and through experience that you're doing in your training, the experience that you've had of other races in order to be able to push yourself that little bit more and be able to cope with what you're going through in that training block, in that in that difficult part of a session, difficult part of a race, and how well you do with experience. Um, often, that's the key element. You know, the, the the evidence seems to show that the more experienced runners have a better repertoire of uh, self talk and skills that they can call on, and they know they've been there before, and they can push through those difficult patches more than a first time runner, first almost certain.
Yeah, our coach, uh, I mean, my past coach, not our current coach um, uh, for me at Allen, but my past coach used to always yell at us on the cross country course. And he would say things like, uh, trust the training. Like that was one of his like, I don't know, his signature phrases was trust the training. I just think that in um, marathon running, it's so hard to trust the training because you never run the marathon distance. Although I might try and change that this summer. Maybe we're going to have some over distance long runs, but you know, you never run the marathon distance and you definitely never run it at marathon pace. And in training, marathon pace feels pretty darn hard. Um, even if it's, let's say, even if it's marathon pace that you've done. So because we've made that mistake, you know, we've done the marathon pace for a three hour marathon in training, found it hard. And obviously we've never actually run a marathon at that pace. But last year we actually ended up running a marathon pace that we did run, that we, that we've accomplished. And I found that was even hard in, in training. So um, how do you, I don't know, is there, is there any trick to building self-efficacy for marathons specifically? Because they're kind of a different beast, I find. Uh, I guess, uh, you know, my, my kind of thoughts, first of all, would be, you know, really thinking about specifically, right, what are the challenges you see if we're talking about that three-hour goal for, and, and a marathon as well? What are the key challenges that you would have lower self-efficacy for? So what parts of the marathon would you feel, okay, that's something I'm not confident I can handle? And And for a lot of, and I'm not... You know, going to suggest that it's this, but for a lot of marathon runners, it's it can be things like okay, the distance if I've never done it before, if I have done it before, it's it's the time, and if specifically it's how I cope maybe with those last six miles. You know that that sort mm -hmm. of point where it gets really really difficult. So then it becomes more about building that very specific self efficacy for dealing with that effort, that pain, those sensations you might experience. Um, and so, okay, what, what sort of strategies can then help with that? So, I mean, on a very basic level, it can be, you know, as Stu mentioned, kind of learning some of these strategies like self-talk uh, for the first time. Um, it can maybe, as you mentioned, you sort of say, okay, I do, I do race-specific training, I do marathon-specific training. I would take that a step further. Okay, are you always, are you always completely rested and, and fresh, if you like, when you're doing those sessions? Um, or, you know, is there a benefit there of doing some of those sessions when your legs are already tired from a tough week or, you know, even a previous day training session? So you're now specifically training for running at that pace on tired legs, which is what you're going to encounter later in the race. So, so it's kind of maybe building, that's just some suggestions, but it's kind of building in things like that, that prepare you specifically for that moment that you struggle to deal with and, and building confidence that way. Okay. Yeah, I guess we we do some of that just because of, you know, we usually pick a plan that's been, you know, put together by someone that's not us. So smarter and um, hopefully, you know, uses it like puts it together correctly. Um, so we normally we do our, I would say, well, I'll speak for myself. Um, all the marathon pace work is usually on tired legs because, um, yeah, I have a hard time getting up to that marathon pace and training. We, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, especially when it's one of those, um, you know, you first warm up for like 10K and then you do your marathon pace. I That, that I usually find pretty tough because, um, you yeah, know, I'm pretty, pretty toasted by then. I mean, I, I get a, I get off a little bit more on the science because I come from a science background. Well, I guess you do too, Liz, because you're mm -hmm. nursing. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, my mantra for uh, for the fast marathon that I did a year and a bit ago my mantra for the last, let's let's say six k. My mantra for the last six k was, your brain is effing with you, basically. Just this is going on. Your brain is telling you to stop. Um, <clears throat> it's giving you the pain, and you have to deal with that. But don't you are not your brain. This is not the time to listen. Um, it's messing with you. You can go quicker. Um, and this this was sort of my scientific way of trying to think my way through those last agonizing miles and keep keep the pace going that, that's really good from a psychological perspective and we, we, we would call that in our in our world diffusion what you were doing there alan yeah. um and it comes from uh, acceptance commitment therapy where it really works quite hard on differentiating what you're mentally experiencing from um you, what you're actually performing and doing so mm -hmm. you're putting psychological distance between 
my brain's just generating these thoughts and under pressure and stress and strain that they're, they're kind of going more and more down and like we talk in the book about um your you know negative thinking increasing as as we're in in a difficult um part of a race which means that the likelihood is untrained we're gonna slow down or or, or buy into the need to quit but what you managed to do with that was put in some distance between saying my brain's coming up with this thinking and yes i am hurting and yes it's psychologically very hard but i know you're just messing with me and like let me just run and do what i did and maybe you had other techniques and strategies you know Noel's big on attentional focus maybe you're using landmarks to help get you through a particular difficult mile you had self-efficacy and belief that if i get through this mile then maybe it'll get a little bit easier and you know i, I you know i think for people listening who are striving for whatever goal it could be a sub four it could be their first time it could be even quicker um being able to use diffusion in your running is a really strong uh, way in which through training and difficult sessions you might help yourself that little bit more get through that give yourself that self-efficacy for when it counts on race day so i have a question then about the diffusion um does it still work if like you need it at kilometer 25? Because that's often my case. Like I, when I completely bonk in a marathon, it's usually quite early. Um, I've bonked before the halfway point. So, so now the, those kinds of things that I'm not really, I don't know if it's it, did I get to the start line overcooked or um, like physically, or is it like a mental thing? Can I, can I, can I, um, yeah, I mean, when can you I say, use this stuff? When you say like, bonk, Liz, you're talking about you get slightly off target pace. No, I get really yeah. off target pace. Like all of a sudden, it would be, it'll be like, um, you know, I'll be running along mm. at four fifteens, and then all of a sudden, it'll be four thirty, and then four forty five, and then for five. Us. Yeah, yeah, we 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 work in kilometers. Sorry, guys, no miles. <laughs> I don't know what that That's... pace is in miles. <laughs> Um, I think, I think it's six, I guess it's like six fifty or something, seven, seven, ten. something mm. like that. Anyway. Yeah. It's, yeah, um, yeah. um, anyway, so, so can those strategies help me if I'm at like kilometer 25 or is there like a limit because, um, that's still, you know, it it would be like more than an hour that I would have to convince myself that my brain is screwing with me. <laughs> no, do you want to go first? I've got some evidence that I can use. I guess, you know, just, just listening kind of, I suppose, two things. What, one, I'll, I'll go back to something Alan said first and then then that one. Um, I was re just, even your mantra, um, Alan, I thought was really interesting where you said about, you know, you are not your brain. Uh, and what helps with that diffusion and that sense of psychological distance is even the language that we use. So you are not your brain is some nice work on, you know, how we phrase our self-talk. Um, sometimes when we we're consumed in whatever we're experiencing, be the effort, perception, or even other, you know, anxiety, nervousness, whatever it might be. We often focus on I, like I'm really nervous here. I can't do this. And we become, as Stu mentioned, totally fused with what we're experiencing, whereas that language can even help to psychologically distance. Um, I guess some, some other things, Les, even just kind of listen to you, you know, I guess I'd sort of be curious now about a lot of other parts of your marathon strategy from even your pacing at the beginning of the marathon. And, you know, sometimes, they, you know, that can be something to look at uh, in terms of how you pace it and whether you're pacing it appropriately to get you the full distance. You know, just something I'm kind of hearing when you kind of say that you you start falling off the pace quite early. But that's that's just a, a curious comment rather than. Uh, yeah. So, else. I mean, I've thought about that, too, because I think sometimes I've gotten the pacing wrong because I would be um, following a race bunny, for example, and the race bunny would be, you know, I don't know, five or ten seconds yeah, faster a uh, per kilometer because, mm. uh, the, yeah, they would build a buffer or I don't know, like but the thing is that for me it's really at my um kind of at my limit so i think that maybe five or ten seconds per kilometer for a whole kilometer um like under pace is maybe uh maybe that's just too much you know you do a couple of those and maybe i've you know just um sacrificed my marathon there so i've thought about that uh and there are some some situations where i know that that's what i did uh, for example, the um, there was one marathon in Ottawa that was in the spring, and it was hot, and we don't have very good training uh, 
We don't have very good training weather in Montreal because it's snow covered. I mean, it's fine for training. You can go run outside. It's just you won't be running any of the paces that you'll normally want to run on, on race day. So it makes it hard to kind of guess what pace you're supposed to start at if you're going for a spring marathon. And so, yeah, I, I know that a few of those spring marathons, I've, I guess I've evaluated what I could do like too aggressively. So that is definitely a case of that. Um, but then there's sometimes where I think that I, I was, you know, smart, like, for example, the last marathon Alan and I did, I actually let Alan go because Alan is notorious for going out a little too fast and he can handle it, but I can't. So, um, um, you know, I, and I, I let him go and we actually, we got to the finish line very close to each other, like maybe 45 seconds difference. But the way that we got there was very different because I started off like behind him and uh, quite a bit behind him at one point. And then I caught him and then I ended up in front of him by a few seconds for the finish. So um, I thought I was smart about it, but I, I st you know, I still didn't get the goal. So I'm not sure. And it was. A I like to bet all the marbles and Liz likes to be <laughs> conservative and uh, and. And, and and bet her marbles gradually as she sees how the game's playing out. Yeah, I, because I've already bet my marbles, you know, it hurts to bet your marbles in a marathon because you Absolutely, only get one chance does. every six months Absolutely, and you get it, it wrong. Like, that's it. You don't get another chance until yeah, six but, months later. Yeah. So <laughs> Maybe a question coming back in your direction then is from the book, reading what we've got in there about strategies to help with um, um, avoiding the urge to slow down or quit. Was there anything that you read that resonated that you think, oh, maybe I need to incorporate that into my training runs or maybe lower distance races to test out and see whether that works? Yeah, I think um, the whole self-efficacy um, idea of um trying to look at my training while I'm doing it and um, find things that I'm doing that I can look back on during the marathon that'll help me like believe. I, I think I think I do have a problem with belief um, because I mean, my previous coach used to tell me I do like I, I never believed anything he said. He would be like, oh, you can run this time. And I never believed him until I could actually do it. Um, and I think like, I've always kind of been like that. I, I want proof that I can do something before I do it, which like doesn't really exist. Um, but it sort of exists in the shorter races because, you know, we would have these things, he would call them indicator workouts, you know, like for example, five times 1K at your 5K pace with, I don't remember, it was like a minute and a half or two minutes rest or two and a half minutes, I don't remember. But he said, if you can do that workout, it means you can do the 5K at that pace. And so- I guess like that sort of idea, I I like that. And you don't get that in the marathon, but I guess I guess if I could find a way to replace it with something different that helps me believe that I could, you know, hold the pace. Um yeah, I uh, I'm not really sure like what how to implement it in the marathon. The marathon just seems like this big puzzle to me a lot of the time. We've had these conversations privately on training runs, uh, like, um, do do you really believe that you can do it, Liz? Um, yeah. And and I and I've I've given my evidence to her why I believe that she can do it because it's basically the same evidence that I use for myself because we run a lot of our paces at the same the same speed together. Mm. Um, you just seem a little more fresh, which makes it hard for me to believe because it seems like you hit paces in training more consistently than I do. And so I guess I tend to, um, yeah. you know, I'll have a good training run, for example, lactate threshold. And I'll be like, yeah, I'm fitter than I've ever been. And then um, I won't hit any other lactate threshold training runs for, you know, uh, a month. So it'll like take away from, from what I've built up in terms of confidence. So I don't, yeah, yeah it's, I, mean, it's I remember tough. when we we ran some prep half marathon, uh, fast half marathon efforts to get ready, and you ran mm -hmm. a fast one like one twenty five or something, mm -hmm. and then we were going to do another one, and I said like, um, three three weeks or four weeks later, 
And I said, okay, I'm throwing down. And I ran 123. Um, and you said, I'm not running. Uh, I've got a 125 in my repertoire. I'm not going to risk jeopardizing the confidence that that brings me by running yeah. another race and maybe getting a, a result that that is worse than that or poorer than that. So you didn't run the race because mm -hmm. not because yeah. of your fitness or anything. It's all mental. It's all just. Yeah. I I'm, wanted to preserve that feeling I, of success. Yeah. So I don't want, I to, go into don't the want race to undo the my good, my good previous yeah. result. No, maybe you can talk about verbal persuasion from from others such as Alan to Liz, and then um, yeah, the yeah, verbal uh, persuasion of self talk to self. I know I've got some thoughts on it. Yeah, no, I guess I'm, I, I guess my thoughts are going in a slightly different direction. I mean, I, I, I think this the rest of this whole podcast could be just questions about you know <laughs> training and what we do. And just all getting that. a private consultation <laughs> from two psychiatrists, psychologists. Um, you know, and yeah, look, the, my my mind is full of questions about um, you know really starting to dig into training and and all the things you do. You know, I think to summarize my thoughts because uh, yeah, we, we could be talking for for quite a while and it would be fascinating. Um, but you know, it's really thinking about, and this may be just advice and based on some of my thoughts, but really thinking about, okay, where am I getting my confidence from right now? You know, if I'm feeling low in terms of belief that I can achieve this, what's taking away my confidence as well? Um, and kind of almost, you know, I would suggest kind of writing those things down. Like what are the key sources? What are the key things that are taking it away? And then looking at those, first of all, looking at the sources, where am I getting my confidence from and how can I, how can I strengthen those? How can I build those? Um, listening, it sounds like a lot of it is, you know, from, from times you're hitting in training runs or times you're hitting in other races. And then obviously the projection, well, if I can do 125 mm -hmm. or 123 and a half, then go the projection on says that, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, but that's maybe only part of, of, you know, all the bits that come together for a marathon, because then it's all so holding a pace, dealing with the tough parts. Okay. Mm -hmm. is, is that something I'm confident about or, or is that something that's taking away my confidence for the race? Um, even, you know, I think, you know, one of my approaches, you know, when we're kind of working on self-efficacy and working on confidence, because our mind is brilliant at knocking and chipping away at things that we, we should be taking confidence from. So again, what somebody else says, I'll, I'll bat that away, you know, and I'll say, oh, they're only saying that to be nice or whatever, you know, we, we're brilliant at doing that. So, so I think it can be really strong to kind of, you know, okay, what are sources of self-efficacy that I can take that I cannot dispute? Um, you know, and so you mentioned about threshold training and, okay, so maybe sort of testing around that, for example, I'm just throwing out some ideas, but getting incontrovertible evidence that, okay, that data says, okay, if I, you know, I have the physical capabilities to run at that pace, because that can be a, a real unknown and a curiosity sometimes. So, you know, okay, that's maybe something. And at the very best, it confirms, yeah, physically, you know, you're in shape to, to run sub three. Um, if not, then it directs your training and it guides your training. So maybe I need to do more of, you know, interval type work or, or actually, you know, maybe I need to get more rest in, into my training. Maybe I'm, you know, so all, all that can sort of help to, to solve parts of the puzzle that at the minute might be just a bit of a conundrum and things I'm not sure about. So I'm, I'm just throwing out a lot of different thoughts. Like I said, this could be, you know, the next hour could be talking all about that, but it's, you know, that's maybe a start of a process. What's, what's adding to my confidence, what's taking it away and then being, been sort of systematic through those areas and one other area that we talk about in the book is about what if planning and i find with runners who may be suffering with confidence problems or a race where things haven't gone so well is to take the time to do some what if planning in order to be able to go back to scenarios that caught them out in in a race and be able to say well in another race what if this happens and, you know, you may have dealt with it in a certain way in that race where you didn't get the result you want. But then you say, well, how I would, what I'd say to myself in my self-talk, the strategy I'd use from an intentional point of view, or whatever it might be, I will use this. And mm -hmm. the earlier that you can bring that into your training and have your list of different scenarios, then when you do your long runs or your threshold runs or long runs with pacing, mm -hmm. you can be really testing those, the what-if strategies. So, oh, this thing's going wrong and it happened before, but now I'm thinking I'm going to do this. So I practice that. And then again, if you come through that sticky patch of the, of the training run and you've tested your what if strategy, guess what? Your self-efficacy is going to go up. 
Mm. And then when your self-efficacy goes up in training, the evidence tends to say in races, that's where it converts. Yeah, I've actually thought about what if um, planning because it wasn't the first time that we read about it. It's been in some other books and and it just seems like very concrete. So, you know, you just think of scenarios. The only problem that I have is that sometimes like the marathon is done so long ago and sometimes just with time, I find that it becomes a little bit of a blur. I almost feel like I need someone to do it with me to remind me the things that I would say or do or think during marathon training, like maybe Alan, <laughs> Alan, maybe I need you to do my, what if, uh, what if planning with me? <laughs> or you could also keep a training diary where I always encourage my runners to be not just keeping the log of what they're doing, distance times sets or whatever, but mm -hmm. against those sessions, what, what mental strategies, the like of which we cover in the book was I, was I using and maybe have a separate document where you've got your, what if planning, you've got your uh, things you'll focus on strategies you'll use counting, for instance, is a classic one. Um, and then you, when you're going back over your marathon training block and you've got this training diary, you can see, oh, I, I use this and I use that. And you've got 13 to 16 weeks worth of data. It might be a little cumbersome to have to do, but then mm -hmm. you're not relying on Alan's memory from 10 weeks back and he yeah. can't remember what he did in that training run, <laughs> alone what you were thinking. Um, yeah, I think I have started keeping um, a journal just because I thought that um, – I wanted to try and keep track of things that were positive because I feel like sometimes with the uh, marathon training, I can get in, into sort of like a little bit of a negative space because it often, often those long grueling runs, they don't really uh, go as planned. So I thought that that my challenge for 2024 would be that after the bad runs, I would have to write something positive every day. So um I've been trying to do that, but um, yeah, maybe I'll add this. I'll try and think of the things that came up and how I could um, do them differently next time or not do them differently, but maybe react differently to the feeling, I guess, because, you know, if you can't run a 415 per kilometer, you just can't run it. But I guess you can give yourself more of a chance with the things that you think. Yeah, I mean, my my comment to my comment to you is that you you can run it. You've evidenced certain things that say you can run it, and you're one marathon nearer towards it. So you've just got to adjust yourself a little bit in terms of what's the next adjustment, and get probably some lucky breaks on the day in terms of weather and stuff like that, because everything has to go right. Um, mm. So Very it's just the, the mentality that I try to give you is okay. It's not a failure. It's a step towards. Step step towards success, you know, mm. and try to try to adjust and keep going, and keep it fun. Um, I guess this is a good time to start talking about um ways to deal with uh, difficult workout or racing, because you guys talk about something that I like to use is um chunking. So maybe you can describe chunking and um and and doesn't matter how big or how small we make our chunks or. What what is chunking and and how should we use it to benefit our training and our races? Yeah, I, I guess yeah. Very simply, um, it's it's breaking mentally, um, breaking a longer distance event or you know um, how far you have to go or or whatever it might be, just into smaller mentally into smaller more manageable chunks so the, the the kind of cliche is you know getting to the next lamppost or getting to the next turn or getting to the next mile marker or kilometer marker or wherever it might be um and you know it, it's actually a re, you know on the back of what we were speaking about as well even in terms of our self-belief is this idea of well if i can get to that mar next marker in the next uh in in this in the pace that i want to run at and breaking it down that way and, and literally mentally going from marker to marker to marker. Because very often one thing that can, going back to perception of effort, one thing that can make um, a race, a marathon, whatever, feel harder is just thinking about how far I still have to go. You know, if I'm running at this pace, okay, I'm holding this pace, or I've dropped it and I've I've still got 10K to go or whatever it might be. So just kind of thinking about that, you know, whether it's the next K, or even the next, you know, as far up the road as I can see and just focusing my 
my attention on getting to that point and then dealing with the next bit when I get there and so on. Um, it can be a nice way of just breaking down the, the challenge of, of keeping going at that pace for whatever is, is remaining in the race. I guess it seems to it seems to be pretty well known by ultra runners because you always hear ultra runners talking mm -hmm. about, oh, you don't run, you don't run a hundred miles. You run between aid stations. Yeah, so you run to the next aid station, and you yeah. don't let your brain think about anything past the next aid station because you go, oh, that's a re that's a reset. You yeah. you you reset and then you run another, I don't know, ten mile race, which is to the next aid station. It's always that. That I guess that's. Them naturally chunking the race. Yeah, th I think events like that, there there can be very natural chunks in it. Um, my mind's gone back to even you know when I was doing my PhD, I interviewed um, uh, runners who compete at the Olympics, World Championships, etc. And an Olympic marathoner spoke about you know standing on the start line and you know her thought process, you know, almost quote her um, what she said in the interview um, was that if you if you thought about running twenty six point two miles or forty two point two k when you're standing on the start line, you'd probably turn around and, and go home again. Um, and even for an Olympian, her thought process was just focusing on getting to the 5K point and then the 10K and then and so on and so on. Uh, so even at that elite level, it's a really helpful strategy for, for various reasons. You know, you can kind of add on to that then. OK, what is my earlier we spoke about goals? What is my process for the first 5K? What is my process for the middle 10k and you know and again breaking it down that way so i've now got something very specific to focus on during and that might be running conservatively in the first 10k uh, and i might be using some of my self-talk strategies or even chunking shorter distances in in the last 10k so yeah it all it all sort of helps yeah i think um for me i find chunking very useful i i use it in workouts all the time because i find certain workouts are if I think of the whole workout, I'm just like, oh, I don't think I could do this. Um, things like when we would do, um, we did this summer, some 1200s at 5k pace. I mean, I just find that is just such a, it, it, it's a fast pace to be holding for that long. I just find that's like a hard workout. I think we had four of them difficult. or five of them to do. It was a, a bit of an over distance. So it was like a bit more than 5k at 5k pace and uh those workouts i'm always chunking i'm like i just have to do one three laps of the track i have to do this at 5k pace and that's it and i only think of that one i find that i try and use it for the marathon and i always have a strategy my strategy is always the same and i think alan uses the same one but we have a gel every 6k so i figure i'm gonna break up my marathon into 6k chunks but even that i find that when i get to like 24 30k it actually starts to get really hard so am i just not chunking small enough like do i need to do half a gel every 3k so that i can get a 3k reset <laughs> i think um what you're saying is the natural experience we go through um in inducing more fatigue as we go further in a long long race and getting good at chunking um, when we've got a set plan, like you're saying, for the 6K um, chunks is is good as a, as a starting point, but also build some flexibility into your chunking so that if you are finding, well, going 6K feels like it's going to be running a marathon Forever. itself, don't, don't stick to it. Have, have more, you know, Noel talked about, you know, the running to lamppost to lamppost, you know, having having a strategy which you've then tested in training where you can um do do something small and it could be that the smaller chunking leads you back into oh i can get back on my 6k chunks after that okay um, smart two two things just as the conversation was going at that point one was um something that um, i learned from andy lane who Stu mentioned earlier um and it, you know was related to the conversation about chunking and and it's the idea that you know our brain will tell us our mind will tell us you know I, I can't run at this pace anymore i can't get to that point um at this pace and and even taking one more footstep maintaining that pace already proves that voice is wrong or that voice you know wasn't wasn't true and, and you know that kind of helps just yeah. to challenge some of those mm -hmm. thoughts uh, and if it's not true at that point then you know, it may not also be true at other points when it's telling you you can't do something. That was one. The second one you mentioned about um, you take a gel every 6K. Um, and earlier in the conversation, you mentioned that sometimes 
especially later in the marathon, you forget some of the, the motivational things or the things that you might want to say to yourself, you know, Mm actually, you know, putting something on your gel, you know, putting a, a motivational, a short -hmm. statement, Oh, that's you're, smart. you know, Yeah, and it's, I it's never a nice, thought of that. it's a nice reminder at that time, time, whether it's your self-talk, um, you know, or whether it's actually something motivational that will, will be a good reminder at that point. That's smart. Actually, I'd kind of tried that in the last marathon because um, our current coach, Bill, um, I don't know if you had the show. Um, oh, gosh, I'm drawing a blank. What What's the show about soccer, but it's not really about soccer? Ted Lasso. Ted Lasso, Ted Lasso, that's it. Um, so he always had he had that poster believe. And so Coach Bill, he started to say that to me before races. He's like, you believe. And so I wrote it on my hand in pen thinking that. I'm going to look at it when I'm doubting, but it like it all Yeah. got Oh, smudged. smudged. So um, I need a better pen. So it actually worked against <laughs> you because it destroyed your belief. yeah, it destroyed my belief. Great. Well done, Liz. I know, I know. See, I, I, I obviously I still need practice or <laughs> better pen or something. I need to write it on my gel. OK, go ahead. Um, something that um, people who are listening to us might be interested in is um, the psychology around using music when you're running. And in fact, I think it's in chapter four, you've got uh, quite a big discussion on the use of music and, you know, everybody, it, it comes up all the time. Do you, do you listen to music when you're running? Oh, I only listen to it like this in this circumstance. Oh, I like to get pumped up before I go. I have the difficult run music uh, playlist or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, And I feel like some people, they will religiously listen to music all the time. And other people, they will religiously not ever listen to music, even during easy runs. now that we're educated, we know there are different categories of using music. Um, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about it. I don't know if you want to go into synchronous and asynchronous, explain that and uh, what these terms mean. And what type of music is best, or should you just not be using it? You're soft if you use music. <laughs> Um, I, I guess, first of all, those, those categories, synchronous and asynchronous, just to explain those terms. So um, synchronous music is music that we might coordinate our, our footsteps with. So synchronize our, our footsteps with. Okay. Um, so it might be at a, a pace, a beat that, you know, matches what we might, you know, what our what our footfalls might be. The, the majority of the research has been with asynchronous music. So it's not necessarily music that we're going to coordinate our footfalls with, um, but maybe it's music that we find, for example, motivational in some way, um, whether that's the lyrics, whether that's, you know, they, they might have some meaning um, or whether it's just, the, you know, the melody or the qualities in another way of the music, the memories it might bring for you, et cetera, that you find motivational. Um, and I guess, you know, what, you know, some of the literature shows um, is that, yes, music can help running in a lot of different ways. You know, it can be a nice distraction, first of all, take our mind off what we're doing, take our mind off what we're feeling um, and help to make uh, running easier or, or more pleasant. I'm in the camp where I don't necessarily like to listen to music when I'm running because I prefer to focus on other things. And so, so there is a personal preference uh, to this as well. That's not to say I always... was that way sometimes when I was younger uh, and less experienced let's say even I, I I always listened to music when I ran um, but I found as I got more experienced I like to tune in I like to listen to my breathing I like to focus on my own self-talk and so I found music distracted me from from that and that's why I stopped using it so so I think you know a broad summary is yeah music can help um, it can be motivational um, it can help make running feel easier etc but but there is a personal preference Uh, to using music as well. So basically, there's no like right or wrong way. So if I don't race with music, so I don't race with music, not because I don't like music, um, but more because I'm afraid that my earbuds will fall out and then that'll be a distraction. <laughs> and I know that's like super silly, but maybe I need to get over that. And maybe I need to try running a marathon with music. Is Could that help me? Well, I could just run next to you and sing. Well, That would I don't motivate think so. you to speed up. <laughs> It might slow her down, that. <laughs> she wants to run away. Yeah. There is, like, like when I all said, there isn't a re the right or wrong way. It is, it Okay. is personal preference. In certain races uh, here in the UK, I don't know whether it's the same in Canada, they actually ban you from wearing Yeah. headphones or running with music. 
I I don't know how many ban, but so, um, some discourage it because uh, they want people to, you know, be aware so that, um, you know, if there's other runners passing or whatever, that they don't run into people and things like that. But uh, I think a lot of them end up tolerating it, you know, as long as um, as long as it's, uh, you know, not um, preventing you from hearing the the outside noises. I think that's usually the the thing that they they'll write on the website. It's like it's discouraged, but if you're going to use it, um, you need to be able to hear what's going on around you. One one of the things, just trying to cover my favorite little subjects, but one of the <laughs> things that um, uh, we we read in your book is is about what are the chemicals, what are the natural messenger chemicals or neurotransmitters or whatever they're called that get released in your brain when you run. I think as runners, as uneducated runners, we always tend to think of endorphins. We go, okay, I'm running in my Saucony endorphins, and that's named after the feel-good stuff that happens in your brain, and uh, you go on a run as high because of endorphins. But I was actually shocked and horrified to read in your book that the release of endorphins <laughs> is not really super concrete sort of proven. Yeah, so so it, it's actually – Really interesting research. Um, so, yeah, I guess, you know, everybody, most people have probably heard of the endorphin hypothesis, as you mentioned, the idea that we get this runner's high and that the cause of that runner's high is, is endorphins. And that comes from some research that has shown that, um, you know, when we, we run, so first of all, yes, you know, our body does release endorphins and endorf endorphins has a pain killing effect. Um, but the slight snag in the theory when, when we actually look at some of the evidence is that these chemicals, endorphins that circulate in our blood are too large to cross into, cross over something called the blood brain barrier. So actually what we might measure in our bloodstream doesn't necessarily reflect what's happening in our brain. Um, and that's, you know, where the endorphin hypothesis breaks down a little bit. What is suggested, what, what more recent research suggests actually cause not so much a runner's high, but more a runner's chill, a runner's sort of, that sort of feel good that we get after running. Is, is something called endocannabino endocannabinoids. And I guess, you know, Saucony endocannabinoids probably mm. wouldn't sell as many pairs. <laughs> no, it, it would be too complicated to say. Um, but, but there's some yeah. really nice research. No, you're to, not getting to... a job in marketing anytime soon, no. <laughs> uh, well, well, I've, well, I've, you know, I've paid him here now. So if that does come out, I want some of the royalties. Um, Perfect. <laughs> but yeah, so so actually, these these substances seem to correlate better with with the the change of mood and the and the feelings that we might get after running and associated with running. And there's actually some some really interesting research um, from David Reichlin and colleagues um, uh, who, who's looked a lot of this. And, and I mentioned earlier the adaptive capacity hypothesis, and this is he's one of the authors that was involved in that work as well. And what they actually found was that not just in humans, but also in running dogs, that we get a similar effect in running dogs, this, this endocannabinoid at release. Um, and again, evolutionary, you know, their sort of theory is that this is kind of one of the things that leads to, you know, the, the desire to run, the want to run, the sort of motivation that we get and the reward that we get after running that sort of feel good, you know, I think, I don't think, you know, if I was speaking personally, I don't think I've ever felt a high as such after running, but I certainly mm -hmm. feel that increase in mood and a bit of a chill after running quite a bit, which is more aligned with what endocannabinoids do rather than endorphins do or are proposed to do. Um, whereas in non-running animals, so ferrets, for example, which don't run very much, don't have the same release of endocannabinoids. So again, we do, animals that didn't evolve to run don't seem to have, uh, you know, this endorphin or endocannabinoid production when, when they run. So it's quite interesting and it sort of suggests actually what changes our mood is, is very different to what we've we've maybe thought for a long time. Hmm. And evolution, I guess, uh, wants us to continue running because they gave us this whole endocannabinoid system. Um, actually, along the same lines, but not really, uh, you talk a lot uh, about sort of mental health because, you know, we've all kind of heard these stories of runners who turned their mental health around like they were uh, depressed and they started running and it really helped them or they had some kind of addiction and they replaced it with running. You talk about something called um, exercise addiction in the book. 
people could potentially be um, addicted to exercise. And I guess for someone listening, they're probably like, well, why would that be bad? Because um, exercise is a good thing. It keeps us healthy and it's much better to be addicted to exercise than let's say alcohol or something else. So um, maybe can you describe, I guess, the difference between just being a passionate runner and then being um, addicted to exercise? Because like, I don't know, maybe people look at me and they're like, well, she's addicted to, to exercise, but I don't, I don't think that's a bad thing in my life. So um, when does it become bad? From a health perspective, I mean, we, we see that if, uh, if it's having a bad effect on your health and maybe you aren't, you know, we've, you might not receive enough calories. And I did some um, research 10 or 12 years ago looking at the mental health of runners um, who had had eating disorders and um, they were more it tended to cross between um, you people with eating disorders who are running would also experience anxiety and depressive symptoms as well and so in that regard um, if if someone is running um, and exercising too much it can tip into um the evidence seems to show that it can it can lead to conditions um, that are, are not obviously healthy, and uh, you know you, when you would when you think about coaching someone for running, you know the thing that a, a good coach would do would be looking at your lifestyle overall, looking at it holistically, and saying what's your goal that you want? You want a three hour marathon? Well, probably if you want to do a three hour marathon, you have to run a certain amount of mileage, and how can you fit that in into your schedule, your life, and are you uh, nourishing yourself and eating enough of the of the carbohydrates that you need in order to be able to be successful so you know i think the way that people are talking to you liz it seems to be that they're saying oh you know she's always out on a run but mm -hmm. i would imagine that you do it very sustainably very well you're looking after yourself in the, in, in the round and it's maybe people who um are you know like with a good intention i'm sure who are who are running and they're doing so much of it and it, it is becoming somewhat of a crutch or it's tipping into giving them a bad mental health or, or worse mental health, should I say. And I'm sure Noel's got more from the book specifically that um, we can reference. Yeah, and, and I guess, you know, I suppose a couple of things to say. Um, one is that even in, even in the literature, um, exercise addiction, and, and actually, you know, it started off in running, measuring exercise addiction. It was originally called running addiction. Um, hasn't been measured very well. Um, and so I suppose one thing that we do in the book is we, you know, we talk a little bit about this, but also include a scale that, that can be used um, as an initial kind of, I suppose, part of a, let's say, okay, a check, if you like. It's not necessarily, and well, it's not a, a diagnosis, if you like, of running addiction. Um, but but I think a couple of things about it, you know, one is to say that there's, there's, there's a lot of components about to running uh, addiction and exercise addiction. Um, Generally, what the research suggests is that, you know, like most people, running starts off as an enjoyable activity. Uh, and most of us get pleasure and get enjoyment out of running, out, you know, and health benefits from running. Um, but very often, and even the mechanisms is not clearly understood in the literature. First of all, we, we begin to see that, you know, running maybe can be used for coping with stresses in our lives. Uh, and very often, you know, when we look back at, at, at exercise addiction, Exercise becomes somebody's main way of coping with stress in their life um, or particular stressors in their life. So I may not necessarily have other ways of coping with that. So I may not have a strong social support around me, for example, or other strategies speaking to somebody that, I, you know, that, that can help with that. Running or exercise becomes my way of coping. Um, and when I don't have that way of coping, so for example, if I stop running for some injured, uh, reason, if I get injured or whatever, um, then I can experience withdrawal um, for, from exercise. Um, so, so there's a lot of components. There's withdrawal, there's salience, there's a compulsion. It can impact on other areas of my life. So for example, I might miss social engagements. I might, it might even impact on my working life because I, I have to exercise and that compulsion that, that I feel I have to exercise. So, so I guess, you know, reason I sort of mentioned those things is there's a there's a lot more to exercise addiction than just seeing somebody who seems to run a lot or seems to exercise a lot. There's a lot of other components to it as well. 
So we can't just say just because I exercise or run every day, then that might mean that I have an addiction, mm -hmm. all those other components. And and the second thing is to understand, you know, the motivations and, and why somebody might exercise. Um, and certainly, you know, something that comes out quite strongly in the literature is is why we run. You know, whether it's kind of like to manage to cope with stressors in our life um, and that sort of feeling of withdrawal when, when, you know, and even sometimes that feeling of guilt if I don't get my run in or if I don't exercise in that particular day. So all these components are quite important to, to understanding um, exercise addiction. And, and I'm led to believe that there's through your book that there's a, an extensive questionnaire online where you can work out what your own motivations are. Yeah, we, we do include various links in the book. One is, so we do actually include in, in the book um, a scale that's used to, as a measure of exercise addiction. Um, but yeah, we do we do include other ones as well. So for example, looking at my motivations to run, et cetera, which is quite, you know, kind of cool just to, to sort of get in. The, the particular one that we include in terms of motivations was used as part of a study that we talk about in the book uh, or a series of studies on, on motivation. So it's, it's, yeah, quite interesting just to look at those in terms of just the various motivations that people can have for running. I guess to finish on a more positive note than than running addiction, there are you you discuss towards the end of the book you discuss a few uh, running based programs, um, and the usefulness of those for kids and adults. I think the one that we've covered and we understand well and know and have participated in is park run. Mm -hmm. um, there's not many park runs, so, so many park runs in North America, but now when you go to the UK, park run is. A standard word in the vocabulary of everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, every time Even you turn your head, there's a park run, mm -hmm. um, and everybody talks about their local park run, and they have whatever PR on their park runs. All these people who never did running when I used to live there are now super athletes because they do park mm -hmm. run, or they're they're. You can have the conversation, whereas beforehand you would be a runner, you wouldn't have the conversation with people, which is kind of cool. Maybe using Parkrun as an example, you know, how do these kind of programs help? Well, I suppose starting with Parkrun, I mean, a lot, a lot. There's actually a lot of really nice research around Parkrun. If anybody hasn't heard of it, I guess just to, to give an idea of the Parkrun concept first of all. So, it's not a race to to begin with. So it's it's a weekly five k event um, held every Saturday morning. Um, it's really, I guess, a mass participation running event. It's about taking part. It's not necessarily, you know, yes, it's timed, but it's not about winning. It's not about being competitive, even though if that is your motivation, then that's certainly what you can go along and do. But there's some really nice research, I guess, you know, a number of things. One is around the mental health benefits. Again, similar to what we spoke about in, in running broadly, uh, the mental health benefits that taking part in an event like, like Part Run can bring. Um, what I really like about some of the research is actually the social um, health benefits that something like Part Run can bring. That it's, it's the idea that you can, you know, as well as going along completing a 5K event, you, you get to meet with people every week. Um, you, you, you expand your social network uh, through something like Park Run. So you get to meet new people, make new friends, et cetera, that you get to 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 catch up with every week. Um, and that social benefit can help to to improve our mental health, et cetera. So, I mean, it's probably, and, and Stu, you might have a few more things to say about this, but it's probably, I would say, the, certainly one of the, if not the most successful mass participation exercise programs there is in terms of the number of people that complete park run on a weekly basis. Um, and I guess a key thing, maybe the last thing I'll say about it is that a lot of people sort of start running. One of the inductions into Park Run is is a couch to five k event, which basically, you know, as it says, gets people from the couch who maybe have never run before to completing a five k. And and the Park Run is usually for a lot of, of groups their five k celebration event. Um, but what, you know, what can typically happen when somebody completes a, a beginner program like a couch to five k is then they've achieved their goal and it stops, and and their exercise behaviors go back to zero. Park Run helps to maintain that and helps to maintain through the social connections, et cetera, people's activity. So, yeah, a really nice program, a really successful program, and I guess a lot of benefits physically, mentally, socially that that can come from it. The, the numbers of people who do Park Run, I, I did used to know it. I was doing research, which we were talking off recording uh, earlier about, uh, is is phenomenal in the UK, as Alan's experience when he's, when he's come back. And it is a... You've got things like Couch to Cap 5K is actually now being prescribed on the NHS, which is our, our healthcare service, by doctors um, as a way of helping people with their mental health. 
um, which is brilliant. And because of the nature of it being so widespread and it being every Saturday, they even do them on Christmas Day and New Year's Day. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 it gives people the opportunity to always be showing up and also be uh, getting healthier if they're participating and um, fostering that human need for connection. Um, it, it, it's not just about running um, all exercise types, tennis, uh, going to the gym, etc. where people get the benefit. Yes, of course, they might see themselves developing um, physically and getting healthier and losing weight or putting on muscle or whatever their motivation is. We talked about the whys. Um, uh, the social connection that um, participatory events do like that is is a huge benefit to mental health and one of the other things which we know uh, from the, the, the psychology studies is where you have people volunteering for events uh, so one of the um, has a very positive effect on your mental health and one of the aspects of, of parkrun is that it's free but they do um, ask you when you sign up to be a runner uh, please volunteer for this event and therefore people who might get injured and they want to go to parkrun but they can't participate or they kind of almost want to people might want to go to parkrun to run but they need to kind of almost um before couch 5k just go along and see an event and normalize it they can go and volunteer and help out um and it's that voluntary um effect which can also have um long-term uh, psychological health benefits Fantastic. Sounds good. Yeah. We don't have that much park run here, but um, we saw, I mean, we have one in Montreal that's consistent and one that's not very consistent. Um, and we did go to one and we brought a lot of our teammates and everybody loved it. Um, there was like coffee after everybody hung around and chatted. So it was almost like, I guess it was almost like the same phenomenon that we have in our team. Uh, mm. But I find that teams are, it's hard to get people that that run alone to join a team sometimes because they're like oh no I like I'm not a real runner like I don't belong on a team yeah. you know they have they think it's like this big deal um when it's really not so people feel they're not worthy of running clubs yeah whereas everybody's park run, worthy of a park run exactly yeah, yeah. before we uh kind of give our overview of the books um where would you like to direct people to get a copy of of your book if they're itching to read it which they will be by now yeah <laughs> okay so um it's possible to obtain it from amazon and other online book retailers um we've got it for sale there uh but also routledge who are the publisher certainly in the uk as alan was saying in the series the psychology of everything there is actually a website the psychology of everything.co.uk where you can buy the book and also um, other, buy some of the books in the series. And there is actually one on the psychology of endurance, which a colleague of ours has written. So when you pick our book up, if you want to buy it, you might also be interested in purchasing that one as well. If you need to get extra psych, you can, you can go for that one. And um, in terms of, in terms of uh, yourselves, if people want to see what you're up to and, uh, listen to things that you have to say or follow you on social media or uh, are people able to do that? Yeah. So um, I guess easiest place to find me is on X or Twitter, whatever you prefer to call it. Um, um, at Noel Bricky, uh, B -R N O E L B R I C K I E. Um, and yeah, usually I share things like, you know, my research, um, you'll find links to the book, that sort of stuff on there. Um, for myself, I run a consultancy called Focus Mind Coaching, which is focusmindcoaching.co.uk. I am not on Twitter, uh, but uh, I do a podcast, the Focus Mind podcast, and Noel has been on there a couple of times. We've been talking about the book. We have talked about strategies. So we go in a little bit more depth, uh, practical how-tos uh, on there. Um, and you can find it on all the usual podcast platforms. Very cool. Great. I'm going to um, add that to my listening list. Okay, should we give our summaries? Okay, so um, The Psychology of Running by Stu Holiday and Noel Brick. There are about 150 pages in the book. So just to give people an idea, it's a sort of pocket book size. But there are about 250. I counted them. There are just slightly over 250 scientific references in the book. So if you like the real story rather than the convenient story, that can be the real story can be a bit more 
less cut and dried, let's say, it can be a bit more uh, nuanced. But if you if that's what you like, then this is the book for you. I I I, I was rather proud that um, you know I wrote a PhD. And it had 350 references in it. And I thought, oh, I'm the man. I've researched that. It took me three years to do that. And it only has slightly more references than your 150-page book. So <laughs> congrats on that. And many of the chapters have real-life case studies or an in-depth example of a real athlete towards the end. So not only do you get some research, but you get sort of the applicability of it. But it is, I would say it is more science than storybook. But in an easy to digest small book format with lots of opportunities to examine your own running differently. And what you've heard today, I think, is us trying to examine our own running difficult differently in front of you guys. I and personally, I think the psychology and mental approaches to running is where some of the, the next advances are going to come from in running. We, you know, we've seen people or getting their physicality together and understanding the biology and the anatomy and the uh, physiolog physiology. Uh, and, and we've seen equipment and super shoes and those kind of things. And I think the next phase is going to come from better understanding of these aspects of, you know, how to program yourself better. People will become faster, more resilient, and importantly, happier when they're running. Um, because of this this knowledge. And um, maybe we've actually started to see it already because Eliud Kipchoge famously always says, you know, human is limited and, you know, everybody kind of um, analyzes him and, and, you know, that's where we get the whole, like, he smiles during his races and it's actually not smiling. He's like... He's programming himself. Pro yeah. yeah. So, um, so I think we've, um, it's already... We're already seeing it, probably, um, just not talking about yeah. it as much yet. That's why so, we're not quite as fast as Elliot Kipchoge. We don't smile enough, Liz. We'll uh, have to work maybe on that. that's it. Oh. Over to you. Okay. Um, so I guess I'm echoing a little bit of what Alan said. Um, if you like science-backed information, then this book is full of it. If you didn't get enough after reading the book, then the authors have a further reading section with references to other resources that you can read, like based on each chapter. So um, if you like a specific topic and um, the book looks small, but it's a bit deceiving because it's actually packed with information. Um, and I mean, you could probably reread it like at least three times and um, and get something out of it each time that you don't remember reading the time before. So um, it's really, really good in that respect. If you want to get more out of your running, then looking at the mental side is a must and reading this book is a good place to start because it will help you, I guess, become more aware of, of your own um, shortcomings. <laughs> or, or your own thoughts. As you, <laughs> yeah. As you yes. Yeah. The ones leading to your shortcomings in races. Uh, and then, you know, awareness is the first step, I think. I think um, then, you know, we can start working on it once we're aware of it. Um, I like the uh, the chapter summaries. At the end of each chapter, there's actually a point form summary of what was in the chapter, which is actually really helpful if you wanted to go back and, um, you know, you don't remember what section you read something in. You can actually just read all the point form. And it actually, it reminds you of what you, what you uh, just read. So um, those are those are great. It's super useful. Yeah. All in all, uh, a great book. You go digging in and then at the end it goes, here are the top level things yeah. that you need to retain. Yeah. And um, cool. and it'll be like, do you remember at the beginning you read about this? And you're like, oh, yeah, I read about that. Yeah, I think I should probably also do that in my training. <laughs> just ahead of the wrap up, I uh, will just say a big thank you to uh, Stuart and Noel for uh, staying up late with us from the UK. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you both for having us on, first of all. And it was actually really nice to hear your summary at the end. Um, it was nice to hear your thoughts and reflections on, I guess, as we wrote the book, some things that we thought would be nice to put in there, mm -hmm. like yeah. the chapter summaries or like the case studies at the end of each chapter. So actually, yeah. it was really nice just to hear your thoughts on those. Thank you for that. And as you can see from our comments and questions, um, we take our job it's not really our job. We take our uh, um, <laughs> podcast seriously. We dive into the book and we, you know, we, we really scratch the pages to see what see what comes out. 
I was just going to say maybe uh, what we can do is also because you mentioned that your podcast had an episode on the book as well. So maybe um, I'm going to go look for it and look it in the show notes. So that means, if yeah. people wanted to, yeah, if people want to mm -hmm. listen to that as well, then they can. We brought a coach um, colleague who worked on Resist as well. The project we were talking about before, he he's the kind of foil that we uh, bounce off. So Ooh, it's got amazing. a bit of a coach's perspective okay. in there as well. Okay, so so drop That's your great. running book reviews subscription immediately and get over there and listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had time since having my second son uh, to do any more podcasts since I'll that bet. one. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for listening to another episode of Running Book Reviews. A big thank you to the publisher, Radlich, for providing review copies of the book. And a big thank you to Noel and Stuart for spending time with us today. If you'd like to leave us some feedback of how we can improve our podcast or want to suggest a book that you'd like us to review in a future episode, please leave us a comment on social media. We are running book reviews on Facebook and Instagram and on Twitter, brackets X, close brackets. We are reviews underscore running. Please also follow us on social media to find out about new episodes when they are released, or you can just subscribe to the podcast on your favorite streaming platform and just get them when they come out. If you've been listening to us for a while and you're wondering how you could help us out, there are a few ways. If you're enjoying the podcast, spread the word, tell your friends, share an episode with them, talk it up. You can also leave us a review on Apple Podcast or a, a star rating on Spotify. We really appreciate those things um, and they help us get out and, and in amongst uh, the public at large. Um, we're also on a platform called Buy Me A Coffee, where if you look for running book reviews on the platform buymeacoffee.com, um, you can find all sorts of little snippets and background pieces and outtakes. Um, and if you want, you can buy us a coffee, but don't feel that you have to. That's all for us for today from Running Book Reviews. Bye for now. Bye.